this world. I'd give it to him right now. Amen. Only one of you? you can't, don't, hey man, let's get rid of this world. Yeah. Huh. Today we're going to begin a small little series inside the series we're doing. We're going to get through 2 Peter chapter 3, I promise. But we got to cover it all. Today we're going to start Looking at this, we looked last week of Jesus' return. Today we're going to start a little series, What Happens After That Return. But before I get there, I wanted us as Team Jesus to understand this. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says this, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, 
do all to the glory of God. This week we have an election. Now for a long time the church has been teaching, not all, but some, Christians should just not get involved in politics. But why does God have us here to be salt and light, right? To make a difference. And that's in everything, everything we do. And there's no part of society we should not be involved in. Can you be a politician and a Christian? Yeah, it's rare, but you can. So voting is something Christians should do, but a lot of Christians don't. And I'm going to put it on the Christians. I'm going to put it on the church in America and on pastors whose pulpits have not taught the truth and then on believers either out of laziness or I'm not getting involved, whatever it may be, not voting. Our country is in the condition it is because of the church. Church not being the church. Neither we're compromising today with the world or we're hiding from the world. One of the ways we do that is we stop voting. So we need to vote. If anyone needs help getting to the uh, voting poll or whatever, just call the church. All right? At least I'll drive you all over town. Okay? <laughs> But here's another thing. Everything we do brings to the glory of God. I'm just going to be honest because I've heard this Christians that vote for candidates, politicians who are pro-life, or I mean pro-abortion, pro-choice. So I'm going to be real clear. People ask, well, who are, we, who are we supposed to vote for? There's a real quick, quick easy test. Is the candidate for life or for death. And no one has the right to murder a baby. Nobody. So if you're a candidate, you vote for a candidate that's for abortion, let me just be clear. You vote for someone who, who's going to get into office and has power, and then they push forward the killing of babies, blood is on your hands. And you'll give an account to Jesus Christ. Just be honest. Proposition 1 that's up here in California. It's about making California the abortion the, a part of the, U, the state constitution. And it's opening the state to abortion tourism so that this state will become the leading state in killing babies. So I'm just going to be clear. I'm not being political. You have, we have a right to a vote. And we need to vote as Christians. We need to vote for life. We need to be salt and light in everything we do. So I just wanted to put that out there. That Prop 1, you need to vote against it. And you need to vote against any candidate, man or woman, who wants to kill babies. It's, it's not hard. Not hard. All right, need to say that because of Tuesday. I'm not going to spend much more, any more time on that. If you have any questions or need any information about voting on this Tuesday, just come see me, please. All right, we're going to be in 2 Peter again, chapter 2, verse 3. Chapter, how do I say that? 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 10. Here we go, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now, we've been here for a while, because Peter, and I'll explain later, he groups two events and basically combines them in one verse. He's not saying they happen right after the other. He's just, there's a reason he's doing this. The day of the Lord is going to come on the thief, as a thief upon the earth. The unbelieving world, that's the beginning of the tribulation period. The burning up of the earth, the destruction of the earth, that's at the very end of God's eschatology. There's a lot in between that happens. There's a reason Peter groups them together, but what I wanted to do before we move past verse 10 is cover everything that's happening in between. Last week, we looked at the second coming of Christ when he will reign, that beautiful, wonderful day. 
Today, we're going to pick up from there, and we're going to start for the next four weeks, including today, so the next three weeks after this one, we're going to be looking at the millennial reign of Christ. This thousand-year reign, it's not taught a lot. A lot of people don't understand what it's all about, what it'll be like. I'm going to tell you the next couple of weeks, it's going to be amazing what we're going to learn. I encourage you to make sure you're here. But today's sermon is entitled Israel and the Nations. The tribulation period is about Israel. Now God's working in the Gentile nations, but that last seven year, that tribulation period, what we call the 70th week of Daniel, is focused on Israel. Now I'm going to Let's look at what I'm saying here from Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel says, 70 weeks are determined. Weeks are years here, seven years. Just like we say a decade is 10 years, a week here is seven years, a period of seven years. So there's 70 weeks according to this prophecy for Israel. Because it says, for your people and for your holy city. This is a Jewish man, Daniel, and the holy city, of course, is Jerusalem. Seventy weeks, God says, I'm going to give you 70 weeks, 490 years, and I'm going to fulfill all of this. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness to the earth. To seal up vision and prophecy, everything that's been foretold in the Bible, going all the way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and also Genesis chapter 3, is going to be fulfilled in these 70 weeks. And to anoint the most holy, Jesus as king, as we saw last week, him returning. 70 weeks are determined, 490 years total. Daniel 9, verse 25. Now, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince comes, the first coming of Christ, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be cut, built again, and the wall even in troubles to times. And remember, Daniel was in Babylon. They were in captivity, and God's saying, Listen, I'm going to bring you guys back, and you're going to rebuild. Jerusalem, you're going to rebuild the wall, you're going to rebuild the temple, you're going to rebuild the city, and then after a certain amount of time, Messiah is going to show up. He says well, it's, going to, it's going to take seven weeks, a block of seven weeks, and a block of 62 weeks. Now, the command came from Artaxerxes on March 14th, 445 BC. We don't get from that from the Bible, we get that from archaeological evidence. So the command goes out to rebuild Israel. He said there's going to be a seven-week period. Seven times seven years is 49 years. So it's going to take 49 years for them to rebuild everything and be back in the land. Then there's a 62-week period after that. 62 times seven, 434 years. There is a 400-year gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between the prophet Malachi and John the Baptist. 400 years of silence where God did not speak to his people through a prophet. And then there's a baby born in Bethlehem. And he grows up to be a man around 33 years old. 433 434 years until Messiah the Prince comes when he rode into Jerusalem which was on April 6 32 AD 10th of Nisan Jesus welcomed as king and Messiah so you have 49 years 434 years equals 483 years 7 years 62 weeks I mean 7 weeks 62 weeks 483 years from the day Artaxerxes says, go rebuild Jerusalem, Jesus rides in to Jerusalem. Messiah the Prince. Whew. 
There's seven years left in the timeline that God gave. 490 years? We've only seen 483 years, but let's keep going. Now, verse 26. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, killed, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come, and the people shall destroy the city of the sanctuary of the prince who is to come. Who destroyed the temple of Jesus' day? The Romans destroyed it, 70 AD. And the people who are going to destroy the city and the sanctuary, and of the people of the prince who is to come, there's a prince coming from the old Roman Empire. This is future. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. All right, after the second bracket of 62 weeks plus the previous seven weeks, which is 69 weeks total, Jesus is going to be cut off. Jerusalem will be destroyed. Then there's a prince that's going to come. You see, after Jesus is cut off, after the Messiah is cut off, seven years remain in God's timeline, but the timeline technically stops here. After the seven weeks and the 62 weeks, 483 years, Messiah is cut off. Then God warns of a prince to come. But the 70th week never happens. 69 weeks happen. The 70th week doesn't happen. There's a break in God's timeline. Why is there a break? Because Messiah came to die for the sins of the world. There needs to be time for a group of people to take the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world to all the sinful people in the world and share the hope of Jesus Christ before that last week happens where God brings an end to all sin and rebellion on the earth. The period of grace, the church age. That's where we find ourselves. But now this prince to come, verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This prince who is to come from the old Roman Empire, he's going to confirm a covenant, a peace treaty, with many for one week, seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years into it, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. They have a rebuilt Jewish temple. We've already talked about that. And on the wing of abomination shall make, be one who makes desolate. So three and a half years into it, he's going to turn on the Jews. Peace treaty is a fraud. He's going to start persecuting them. They're going to flee for their lives. Two-thirds of them are going to be killed. So Daniel sees this. Now let's fast forward to Daniel chapter 12. Although I heard, I did not understand everything that he's been being told here. He said, I didn't understand it all. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the end of the day, until the end of, till of, till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined. He's not going to tell Daniel. But until the time of these things, many are going to be purified, made white and refined. What is that talking about? Being born again. The gospel of Jesus Christ were made white as snow. But the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand. Boy, that's obvious, isn't it? But the wise shall understand. Daniel didn't understand what the, what the, what the angel was showing him of these end time things, events. But he says, people are going to get saved. The wicked are never going to understand. They're just going to keep doing their thing. But the wise shall understand. We, there's a time coming towards the end. They'll understand. Oh, we understand today, do we not? Verse 11. And from the time the daily sacrifice is taken away, what was talked about in the previous couple chapters, taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up. That's where the Antichrist walks into the, to the temple at three and a half years into the last seven years. There shall be 1,290 days. Now this is very interesting. There should be 1,290 days. That's 1,290 days. But the tribulation is divided into two three-and-a-half-year sections, which are 1260 days, 1,260 days. But here we're told there's a point of 1,290 days 
which is 30 days extra. And he says, he adds this 30 days to the timeline, not to the tribulation period, but basically 30 days after the tribulation period ends. And he connects it with the daily sacrifices and the abomination. So he's connecting it to the main focus of this verse is not just the 30 extra days, but it's the temple. Hold on to that. Go to the next slide, Levi. So what we're seeing here is the tribulation period, 1,260 days on each, each half, but we see an extra 30 days because he says 1,290. So there's an extra 30 days added on to after the tribulation period. And the focus is the temple, context of the verse. All right, that was verse 11. Let's go to verse 12 of that same chapter. Blessed is he, though, who waits and comes to the 1,335th day. Blessed is he who comes to the end of this 1,335 days, which if you take it past the 1290, which was the extra 30 days, now we have an extra 45 days. Blessed is he or she who comes to the end of this 45th day plus 30 after the tribulation. So it's 75 days. So in scripture, we have this 75-day interval between Jesus returning to the earth and the beginning of this millennial kingdom, which we will start to study next week. What's this 75 days about? Well, the first 30 days, the focus was in, in the verse, the temple, the restoration of this temple, of a new temple, a millennial temple. And it's also focused on restoring Jerusalem and Israel, the apple of God's eye, the place where he will have his government centered on his worldwide government when he returns. Let me show you. Zechariah 14. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. Remember, when he's returning, he's coming against the nations. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. And as he fights in the day of battle, and, and in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's why we say he returns to Jerusalem. When he comes to go against the nations, they're gathered together there in Israel on the plains of Megiddo to do battle with him. And he comes down, he speaks to them, wipes them out, and then he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. And look what happens. Which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. It's going to change the land, the land features here. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it towards the south. Verse 5. Then you shall flee from, through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. Who's that? That's us. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will be diminished. diminished. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord. Only he knows. Neither day nor night, but at any time it shall happen that it will be light. Verse 8, And in the day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea, half of them towards the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. This is going to be nonstop water, living water. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name is one. So that first 30 days, and I'll show you this a little bit more in a couple weeks, he's restoring Israel. It talks about the land coming to life. Remember, the tribulation period, Jerusalem's been bombarded by the Antichrist. He's restoring it. Ezekiel 40 and 48, if you want to read it, talks about the new millennial temple there in Jerusalem. This, this is where Jesus will sit upon his throne of his worldwide government that he's about to set up. We're going to talk about that in two weeks. But this focus upon his return and the all Mount of Olives split in this living water that's going to change the landscape of Israel. 
And as God spoke in the very beginning, let there be, boom, creation came into existence. He's going to be speaking a lot of things. But first and foremost, Israel is restored. Jerusalem and a new temple. Now let's go back to the 75-day interval. Now, 30 days we understand. Now let's look at the 45 days. Because this is, if you get to the end of this 45 days, fifth day, oh, you are blessed, the scripture says. Now, this is talking about the people upon the earth who have survived the tribulation period. It's not talking about us. We've been resurrected. We've been glorified. We're with the king. But there's going to be many people, believers and non-believers, who have actually survived the seven-year tribulation. He says, if you make it to the 45th day after the tribulation, oh, you're going to be blessed. What is he talking about here? What he's talking about is what we refer to as the judgment of the sheep and the goats, the judgment of the nations. Let me show you. Revelation 19, which we talked about last week. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We talk about this is the day Jesus returns. We are with him. He's returning to bring judgment and to make war with the Antichrist, his armies, and the nations that have come against him and against Israel. Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus said, they will be, Then you will be delivered, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. Why is he coming to make judgment on the nations? One, their sin. Two, their hatred of him and his people, Christians and Jews. They've hated, they've hated the name of Jesus Christ. They've hated the grace. They've hated the word. God's given them time to repent, but they've refused. So he's coming to bring judgment upon the nations. Joel spoke about this in the Old Testament, Joel 3. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there. So he brings the Jews back to the land, reestablishes Israel in the land. This is where the final end time events are going to happen. For 2,000 years, the church has been wondering when the end times is going to be. Well, for most of that time, Israel was not back in the land. They couldn't happen. But guess what? In 1948, Israel reestablished Now, the end time events can start to happen. And that's when the clock started to tick. Now they're back in the land and he's going to bring all the nations. He's going to bring them down there and he's going to enter into judgment there. Why? On account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up the land. How many of our presidents are trying to create peace in Jerusalem and Israel in the Middle East by dividing up the land and the city, Jerusalem, that God gave to his people. Everyone, since I can remember now, why is God going to judge them, judge the nations? Because they've come against his people and tried to divide his land. Zechariah spoke about this as well. Zechariah 12, verse 2. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people. Everyone in the, towards the end, the whole world is going to be fixated on Jerusalem, that little city in that little nation. They're going to be so concerned with Jerusalem. When they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem, that's going to happen. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all people, everybody in the world. All who would heave it away, everyone who tries to to dismiss Jerusalem or who tries to give Jerusalem away from Israel to a group that Palestinians who don't even, 
It's not even real. They're not real people. They're physically real, yes. I'm thinking, there is no such thing as Palestine. There was never no nation called Palestine. It was always Israel. That's another subject for another day. But he says, I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all people. All who would heave it away will be surely cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. When is that going to happen? Well, that happens during the tribulation period. All nations, including this one, including ours. That's why God's coming back to judge the nations. That's why he's given this 45 days after he's restored his throne in Israel. He's going to judge the nations before he starts his reign. So all the nations have come against Israel. So Jesus is going to judge those, the people of those nations. Jesus described this in Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. He's restored Israel in those first 30 days. All the nations will gather before him and he will separate them from one another as shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. And this is why we say the judgment of the sheep and the goats. All those of those nations who came against Israel, which are all of them in the world, all those who have survived the tribulation period, believers and non-believers will stand this judgment. This is not the final judgment. This is just a judgment before the millennial reign. Matthew chapter 25, verse 33, and he will sit and he will set the sheep, his, those that are believers, he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Goats have always been symbolic of evil or sin. From the Old Testament, the escaped goat, to the occult today who has a goat head for their symbol of Satan. He will set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left, unbelievers that have survived the tribulation period. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared before for you from the foundation of the world. This has always been in play. It's always been the plan. Christ would return. He'll establish his kingdom. Blessed are you. You're going to about to enter in that millennial reign. That's why they're blessed if they make it to the 45th day. They enter into the millennial kingdom. Verse 41 of that chapter. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's why hell's there. It's not for us, but humanity has rebelled and pridefully rebelled and sinned right along with Satan. They, we followed his lead. And so now humanity can end up in the same place meant for Satan. And think about this. These people made it through the tribulation period. We've already talked about how bad it is. They've made it through the worst time in human history. And now there is the millennial kingdom. Oh, and I wait till I get to it and explain what this is going to be like. But it's right there. They're so close. They made it through the tribulation period, but they never put their faith in Jesus Christ. They don't have the blood of the lamb put on their account. So what happens after they survive the worst time in human history? And the millennial kingdom is right there. They're judged and put into hell. Boy, that's not a popular message today, is it? It's not very encouraging, Pastor. Well, don't blame me, blame Jesus. He said it. It needs to be said. Because if you're not in the blood of the Lamb, you have nothing. You may gain the whole world, but you're gonna, in the end, you're going to lose your soul. Whether it's here in this time, or in the tribulation period, or right after the tribulation period, you're going to lose it all. You need to be found in 
Jesus Christ. And it's not just up here going, yeah, I believe in Jesus. It's being found in Christ. Born again. New creation in Christ. The heart and the soul. Everything. And that's why we, when you really understand the truth of Jesus Christ and what the Bible teaches, you can say, take this world and give me Jesus because there's nothing in this world like Jesus Christ. Whew. 75-day interval. 30 days to restore Jerusalem, the land of Israel, the throne of Jesus Christ, his world government. 45 days for the judgment of the nations and which we will see in three weeks during this 45-day period, the restoration of the earth. First Jerusalem, it's always salvation to the Jew first, then the Greek. Restoration of Israel, and then the restoration of the earth. The earth that has been decimated by seven-year tribulation period. Trees have been burned up. Green grass, destruction of the seas. God restores the earth for this millennial reign. I'll show you the verses, amazing verses. Garden-like, Garden of Eden-like conditions. We're going to be there. We're going to experience this. We're going to look at it in three weeks, what it's like. Oh, Three weeks from now, when I give that sermon, I'm going to try to explain the best way I can what life is going to be like. It's going to be so amazing. You know, I can't imagine what it'll be like for those who are put on the left hand who have survived the tribulation period and they see the millennial kingdom that others are entering into. And you're removed. Why were they removed? Because they were in their sin. They never repented of their sin when they were born again by the blood of the Lamb. This morning we celebrate communion what this table represents. This, this table and this little wafer and this little juice do not save you. They don't cleanse you. But it's symbolic that we remember how we were cleansed 16 years ago, 24 years ago, 72 years ago, a year, a year ago, how we were cleansed because we put our faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we ask God to forgive us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that this 75-day interval for us will be so amazing. We'll be there. We'll see it. And we'll see this millennial kingdom because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Today we're going to look back and remember. Because looking back and remembering what Jesus did for us gives us the ability to look forward to what he's going to do. So if I could have the ushers come on forward. Before Judas betrayed him on that last night, before the trials, the beatings, the scourging, before it all, he sat down with his disciples, including Judas, and broke the bread. So this is my body, which is going to be broken for you. The body that was ravaged to pay for the sin, our sin. The body that was put upon that cross and pierced. Eat and remember him. And he took the cup and said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. 
the blood that is shed for the remission, the purification, the removal of all your sin, all our guilt, our shame. It doesn't cover our sins. It removes them. Where we used to be blemished, filled with spots, it's washed us as white as snow in the eyes of our Father. The blood that dripped from his back, his hands, his feet, his side, from the thorn of crowns around his head. The blood required for the removal of our sin. Drink and remember him. Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you were in, for the joy that was set before you endured the cross. That is such an amazing statement because the cross, was, there was nothing joyful about hanging on a cross. It was shameful. It was degrading. And it was excruciating to the body. But for the joy that was set before you endured the cross on our behalf. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you. Lord, we thank you that we can look back to the moment you brought salvation to us. And now we can look forward to the moment when we're with you and we see all that you have promised you're going to do in the future. So Lord, we're between those two points, the point of looking back and the point of looking forward, and here we are. Today, this is where we are. And we have a mission, and we have a purpose. It's to be salt and light in this dark world that is lost. So I ask you to help us to remember what you have done. Help that to motivate us to live for you. You gave everything for us. We need to give back, give you our lives as living sacrifices to live for you so that our loved ones and other lost individuals today will, will see the future and be blessed because you used us. So Lord, help us to, help us to live for you, to understand what's really important in this world and in this life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, I don't see what I'm supposed to be seeing back there. And I think security went to go get them. The children, or not all of them, um, but a handful of the girls, I think, maybe wanted to share a song they've been working on with the church. And so they're going to give us our closing song tonight. So team, come on up, because we're going to support them. Come on up. You guys are the pips. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, guys, we're ready. All right. <laughs> That's typical. She does that all the time. So they're on their way. So this is a little song that they've, they've done for a while, and it's it's got a good beat to it. It's all focused on Jesus. Very good stuff. What Wendy is teaching them, she's laying a foundation in those young hearts of the truth of God. And so they're going to be coming up here and they want, to, they want to celebrate the truth of Jesus with you today. So they're coming. <laughs> Trust me, they're coming. Wendy's never late. <laughs> it's not 12 o'clock, yeah. So, hey, we're going to go over. It's 11.59. It's Wendy's fault today. Come on, Wendy. Come on up, guys. Oh, they got security escorting them. They must cause trouble. Come on. Oh, this is not even all the kids. A lot of the kids are gone today. Come on, good, good. Come on up, class. All right, you guys ready? All right, come down through here. Come down through here. Come down. 
So everybody can say, good job, good job. All right. Miss Wendy, are we ready? We're ready. Let's go. Wendy threw me all off. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over sin and death. Judgment of the nations, victory over rebellion. From now on in Christ, we just get to experience one victory after another. Amen. Amen. Let's go. Victory, guys. If God is for me, who could ever be against me? And if God is for me, I don't need to fear the enemy. There is victory in Jesus, there is victory in Him. He gave me grace, I gave Him my sin. He died on the cross and then He rose again. There is victory in Jesus, there is victory in Him. This will be our battle cry The tomb is empty, he's alive B-I-C-T-O-R-Y The enemy better run and hide The king of kings is on our side B-I-C-T-O-R-Y B-I-C B-I-C-T-O-R-Y B-I-C-T-O-R-Y The accuser comes at me as quick as he can But no weapon formed against me will stand I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Protected forever by the great I am There is victory in Jesus, there is victory in Him He gave me grace, I gave Him my sin He died on the cross and then He rose again There is victory in Jesus, there is victory in Him B-I-C-T-O-R-Y This will be our battle the tomb is empty, he's alive B-I-C-T-O-R-Y B-I-C-T-O-R-Y The enemy better run and hide The king of kings is on our side B-I-C-T-O-R-Y Let's go! I used to be able to move like that back in the 80s. For, uh, for um, Randy, it was the 70s in disco. But uh, Sharon, too, right? You're that old, too? Yeah, all right. So, all right. Good day, because we get to look forward to this amazing period where God's going to reestablish the earth and the millennial kingdom. But we need to warn people. They need Jesus Christ. It's best to do it now before the tribulation period. But if they, they can reject Christ, even if they make it through the tribulation period, they're not going to make it into the millennial kingdom. We need to warn them. We need to share Jesus with them. There is victory in Christ, right? Right. So 
All right, we are Team Jesus. Now, you guys were in here before, right? We're going to do one, two, three, and break, okay? You going to join us today? All right, here we go, team. Come on, stand up, team. We're going to be out of here. New week. Some of you guys are heading off to Florida, all right? Now, when you're in the land of the free in Florida, you got to come back to California, okay? All right, so, but uh, let's... This new week, let's go out, let's live for Christ. Take every opportunity you can. May, may not get one, you may get one. Maybe small, maybe big, doesn't matter. Let's live for Jesus Christ. Let's break out of here on the count of three. You guys ready? One, two, three, break. Let's go. Woo.